Hi, good evening. Okay, so I have to stick to seven minutes, so I'll just get on, right? Niramai. It means being healthy, being without diseases. The first problem that we are trying to solve with Niramai is uh, breast cancer. This is one of the biggest and largest cancer killer in women today. 500,000 women are dying because of this terrible disease. Not just uh, elder women, um, about 50, 60, even younger. The average age is coming down to 30s. Now, in India alone, 75,000 women die out of this disease. The unfortunate thing is breast cancer is probably one of the very few cancers which can be cured very, very fully, right? The lady can just get back to normal life without having signs of cancer at all if detected early. In India, 60,000 women could be saved if this was directed early. They wait till there's a huge lump before even going to the hospital. So we looked at uh, what are the problems for uh, making this early screening happen. Uh, incidentally, technology limitation uh, stands out. Um, today, mammography, which is uh, one of the common way of doing uh, uh, cancer screening, does not work on younger women. It looks for lumps mostly. and. Uh, lumps can be 2 mm or 5 mm or even uh, 2 centimeters. So accuracy is a question, especially when you consider a whole lot of uh, you know all age groups and things like that. It uses x-rays to figure out whether there's a lump or not. And uh, as you know, radiation is not a great way to do screening because it can itself cause cancer uh, on repeated use. And of course, accessibility and affordability makes a major role in uh, making many women actually, uh, especially in the developing world, to use this solution. So out of all this, because of all this, what's happening is only 10% of the women who need to undergo this screening is actually going through this. That is, out, instead of 2 billion women who, who need to do this screening every year, only 200 million, including the US population, is all that is going through. And in India, it's just about 2% of the women who are going through this. So because of all these issues, the most common method of finding cancer today is the hand, right? You know, just a clinical breast examination uh, to look for lumps. So in this stage, uh, Niramai, uh, which is our company, we have brought out a new method of doing breast cancer screening, which does not necessarily look for lumps. It looks for abnormal tissue activity in the lady. It is completely non-contact, non-invasive. It's a privacy aware where nobody touches or sees the person while this uh, is happening. It's completely safe, no radiation. We just measure the temperature of the chest. It works for all women and uh, it is portable. I can just put it in a bag and do rural screening as well as uh, you know corporate screenings. So what we'd start with is a new modality for uh, uh, looking for signals of cancer, which is Thermography, of course, thermography has been around, but uh, just like X-rays, where you no know, people can read these X-rays to figure out something is wrong or not, people have tried to read these thermal images or heat maps of the chest in order to detect cancer, and it's extremely high uh, level of expertise that is needed, extremely complex task to actually detect cancer in this thermal image because there can be several reasons why something is hot. It could be a cyst, it could be fever or something like that. How do we differentiate malignant heat patterns uh, you know, versus other ones? And that's exactly where we use AI um, and we call it thermalytics. It is thermal analytics where we take uh, five images of the lady, of the chest, uh, using a high sensitive thermal camera create these heat maps, and then do uh, analytics, machine learning on these image, uh, images that we have caught to accurately determine the location of uh, the tumor and also say whether that lesion is malignant or not. Uh, we actually, uh, you know, as, as you can imagine, uh, the first thing you have to do is to compare and contrast with how an expert behaves. And instantly, machine learning, I think, uh, is, is ripe and we are able to get to a higher level of accuracy than the expert itself by sure computational power and our ability to model the expert's decision process using uh, multiple and ensemble of machine learning. And the key challenge, of course, as I was saying, is not just about detecting whether it is um, you know, hot or not, it's also about detecting whether it's really malignant. When you have cases like this, it could 
be a cyst or a hormonal response, how do we differentiate these things? And that's where we have actually come up with new features of uh, image patterns uh, to do this uh, training of machine learning. And uh, we have uh, filed 10 patents, out of which three have been granted. Uh, so we believe with machine learning on thermal images, uh, we are uh, able to uh, propose a new method of doing breast cancer screening, which can provide high quality healthcare sensitivity as high as MRI because we are looking at tissue activity. Abnormal tissue activity results in a small increase in temperature and blood flow, high blood flow also results in an increase in temperature and that's what we're looking at and that is much, much earlier than a lump which is a structural change that happens. And so the sensitivity can be as high as an MRI and uh, it can be at a very, very affordable cost. Um, uh, we've actually done a lot more uh, studies to figure out how it can complement uh, uh, mammography and ultrasound even in hospitals. It could be for a younger age group, it could be uh, for uh, treating patients who have already had a surgery once, right? You know, they are likely to get uh, recurrence and even for those patients, we are able to use uh, thermographic analysis. So from a market size perspective, at, uh, two uh, kinds of business models. One is where we actually set up these solutions in uh, hospitals and diagnostic centers uh, as an alternate modality to the existing methods. It can be used for preventive health checkups and things like that. Uh, in addition, we have outreach programs where we par partner with corporates uh, to do corporate uh, health screening for the working women who just have to come out 10 minutes from their working schedule, just like having coffee. They just come finish their screening and go in a completely privacy aware manner where nobody touches or sees the person. And um, and, and again, uh, we have done uh, multiple rural camps uh, in order to address the uh, rural community uh, where they don't have any access to healthcare. So uh, the ecosystem has been uh, very kind to us. Uh, you know, we have been part of uh, several uh, accelerator programs, the recent one being Philips. And of course, we are part of NASCOM 10K. And uh, we've been uh, fortunate to have won a few awards as well and uh, yeah so uh, we welcome you to partner with us to save many lives uh, with this universal uh, solution for detecting early stage malignancy thank you thank you thank you um, Sanjay Arjun Rithik uh, it's been a pleasure working with NASCOM I know it's been a long two days I'm gonna keep it short and sweet let's you know wrap it up in the seven minutes that uh, uh, Arjun gave us. Um, um, machines have always been talking to us. Um, have we been listening and interpreting those signals? They've always been generating data. Have we been able to make an impact with that data? That's essentially what you know Fluchura is focused on. We listen to machines. We are, in simple terms, the Fitbit for the machines. Um, uh, most of you are aware of, you know, the car journey, you know, when it was really called a car, you know, meant to transport people from one end to the other. Uh, there was absolutely no sensors. It went through its own journey in terms of flu rudimentary edge intelligence that was in there. Moving on to, oops, moving on to a digital umbilical cord, there are, you know, absolutely a number of sensors, you know, and you're collecting a large amount of data. How do you utilize that and diagnose problems in that? And are you able to, you know, solve issues before they really happen? Uh, and today, of course, I think we have had enough talk about autonomous car. Whatever you've seen in this journey is what is currently happening, you know, at stage one in the industrial world. Uh, these industrial machines, be it the turbines, be it the compressors, be it, um, uh, you know, any of the uh, industrial mixers, for example, uh, they are all commoditized. How do you ensure and differentiate if you are an original equipment manufacturer and or if you are an end customer who is utilizing that equipment, how do you take advantage of the significant amount of data that is coming out of it? Uh, GE beautifully coined this term as industrial internet of things. That's essentially where uh, Fluchura is playing a role on. Um, we do this through our platform, uh, Cerebra. It's called all the technologies that you've probably heard today. I'm just going to skip that. But let me take you one example of what Cerebra has brought about uh, business impact with one of our customers. Um, a world-leading adhesive manufacturer uh, based out of Germany, a $20 billion organization, uh, uses our technology. What essentially was the business problem was um, 
they have a very narrow band of acceptance from their customers on that industrial glue that they produce okay and what they want to do is produce that industrial glue right every time they manufacture so they want to hit the bullseye every single time they manufacture the product now how do we enable that we started the implementation in the world's largest adhesive manufacturing unit on the outskirts of shanghai today we've been fortunate to be implemented in more than 20 manufacturing plants of this particular customer uh, what we essentially did was looking at a digital process twin you know from the raw material to the end product going through all of these machines that make up the manufacturing line looking at the sensor data looking at the ambient conditions looking at the raw materials which starts off till the quality of the finished product and uh, you know how do we make that transformation now what we have achieved is with 95 percent accuracy we've been able to identify during the manufacturing process okay which batch is going to end up with poor quality so it's not at the end of the manufacturing process which is more post-mortem analysis which is what most of the customers are today but ours is during the manufacturing because that's when you can intervene in real time so what happens to our end customer is the quality team which was a mere inspector of that particular product has become one of the most critical aspect because he is able to intervene in real time when he sees that hey this product is likely to be of poor quality can i add an alternate raw material can i run the industrial machine at a slightly higher rpm or a torque so that the softening point or the viscosity comes back closer to the benchmark this is the transformation that we have been able to bring about for you know the industrial adhesive manufacturer uh, obviously it's been a tremendous uh, amount of uh, saving for them you know looking at close to hundreds of millions of dollars across their 100 plus manufacturing plants uh, that's the kind of uh, ROI uh, that they have projected and they've already uh, seen significant out of the 20 plants that we have been able to implement uh, fortunately for us uh, you know the uh, head of uh, global head of quality dr. Michael Murgat had to say this he says I've seen the future of you know Henkel the customer in what Flutura is doing with data so it was a proud moment for us when in looking at the transformation that we've been able to bring about uh, in the uh, hands of our customer uh, this is another example again uh, in the oil and gas sector uh, this is uh, uh, an early production system for for those of you more on the upstream side it essentially once you detect oil uh, you're trying to look at the quality of the oil that is available before you set up an oil rig that's essentially what this early production system does and what we have been able to do is again create the analytical digital twin of this entire equipment uh, and bring about real time monitoring real time analytics on top of once you are the uh, the oil is coming in you are able to predict what is the amount of sand in it what's the amount of water or you know gas in it so that you decide whether it is worthy of setting up an oil rig now this is something we take really pride on because uh, we set this up in as little as two days you know with our platform so that's two examples of the transformation that uh, Cerebra has been able to bring about for our customers uh, fortunately uh, you know there are customers globally and in India who have trusted us a few of the names over there be it uh, somebody like Patterson who is the second largest drilling contractor in the world or the Procter & Gamble uh, who is a leading FMCG play we have been fortunate uh, to be working with many industrial players essentially all of them use it for two primary use cases either they are using Cerebra to improve the equipment uptime and reliability of that particular equipment that they are using or they are bringing about uh, you know improving the quality or the yield at the end of the manufacturing looking at a set of machines working in tandem uh, we've been fortunate uh, and humbled to be recognized globally uh, by the likes of uh, Bloomberg, Forrester, Forbes and Deloitte etc 
and uh, our vision uh, is to be the number one industrial IoT intelligence platform for energy and engineering and we are proud to be uh, headquartered out of India uh, and backed by some really strong uh, virtual venture capitalists. We have uh, been invested by Vertex Ventures, uh, Temasek Holdings out of Singapore, as well as Loomis Partners and The Hive out of uh, Valley. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, I hope this was useful and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, last speaker today talking about agriculture last last, last, last. thank you thanks a lot <laughs> uh, but talking about agriculture it's a area which is very close to all of us uh, we are basically trying to incorporate ai into agriculture which is new trend which is being called as precision agriculture uh, sorry right so uh, what we are doing is we are actually using uh, artificial intelligence uh, and computer vision which, uh, which is basically means image recognition across the complete supply chain of foods right right from farmers to the end consumer which could either go through the modern ch channels of retailers and etc or it could be a traditional channels of mandis and uh, uh, trading companies and all right so across the value chain we, which is a 5 trillion dollar company globally and a uh, 500 billion dollar market in india we are trying to standardize the quality and quality grading processes which is today purely manual uh, like our grandmothers used to do, they would pick up vegetables and then see it and say it's good or not good or they would pick up grains and say, say this is not good or this is good quality. It's still being done today, imagine in 2017. And what we are doing is we are just simply uh, changing that out by uh, using images, right? So like I said, uh, we've got uh, manual inspections, whatever technology is there, it's purely lab based. These labs probably are about 100, 150 across India. So what we've done is we've created an app which works on a mobile phone, any mobile phone, three megapixels or above. Uh, you can take the photograph of the grain sample and then it gives you all the quality parameters right from broken grains to shriveled grains to vivid grains to foreign matters, uh, any other particles which are there works right from wheat to jar to bajra to moat to even mustard seeds. Right? And then it gives uh, bases all the parameters, it gives you the ISI uh, ranges saying okay for this particular parameter this is range 1, range 2, range 3 and gives you a final sample uh, quality output which can actually be used for price determination. Now this is being, li this is uh, gone live uh, in uh, 7 Mondays in Rajasthan, tomorrow, uh, day after tomorrow we've, uh, the agriculture minister of uh, Rajasthan is uh, inaugurating it and a couple of other Mondays in Udaipur and where farmers when they come in they only know that they have got a, they have got wheat or they've got mustard and this is the minimum support price now as soon as they enter they know that they have got a grade one wheat for which the price should be x rupees above the minimum support price so that's the kind of uh, work we're doing uh, on the other side we've also taken it to fruits and vegetables this is a uh, work which we are doing with the uh, reliance retail again uh, even for reliance retail their quality guys would uh, get the lot of tomatoes 15 kgs of tomato they would take up the crate sort it out manually say this much is good this much is bad so I am assuming that overall the sample is good or bad and I should accept it or reject it so uh, imagine a person looking at 15 kgs of tomato sorting it out by color sorting it out by whether the tomatoes are ripe overripe or sorting it out by do've got any diseases or deformations or not instead of all that the moment he gets 15 kgs of tomatoes he clicks a picture Again, across all the parameters, there are about seven to eight different parameters, which are mostly visual. All these deformations get captured, measured, and then a final report gets made saying should this particular lot be accepted or rejected. And uh, all this information gets digitized by the lot number, by the vendor, by the truck number and everything. So, uh, so the person sitting in the headquarters can actually see how many lots have been cleared today at what quality levels and what was the result. And if he wants, he can look at the photograph also. Uh, as we are speaking, we are taking it to the stores, where in the store using CCTV cameras, we'll be able to tell, okay, if the bin uh, is empty or not, and then if uh, there is some produce or some tomatoes in the bin, are they good quality or they are rejectable quality or not. So that the quality which customer sees is now available to the retailers. So that's the kind of work we are doing. Uh, where we are is we've today got about 12 commodities which we've trained in. Now we are looking at uh, taking it across to different uh, commodities. The infrastructure is up, the platform is up, the models are up, the AI models are up. Now it is all about applying it to across different commodities, across different fruits and vegetables. 
Uh, we're working, like I've said, we're working with uh, clients like Renance Retail. There are clients like uh, Bhumi and all, which are agri-tech companies. They are sourcing organic foods. There are uh, companies like Colam, which are the biggest commodity traders in the world. We've been uh, recognized and awarded by uh, quite a lot of uh, organizations, the last one being the uh, Emerge 50 Award yesterday. And uh, we've been uh, working with Fiki, Food Bites, uh, NAS, and uh, Indigram, even with DST and DIPP. Right. Uh, looking ahead, what we are trying to do is we are trying to increase the number of commodities which we have. Uh, looking, at, uh, we move, get more fruits and vegetables into the grain. We are also in, uh, moving into the near infrared spectroscopy, which is not your mobile-based images, but actually uh, NIR and hyperspectral images. Now these can help actually look at what's inside the fruits and vegetables. At, uh, near NIR can be used to find maturity in fruits such as apples and bananas. Hyperspectral can actually be used to look at the ripeness or the freeze damages. So if if the apple is coming from a lot of uh, deep freeze, uh, it spend a lot of time in deep freeze, there could be freeze damages, it becomes soggy and brownish from the inside, but from the outside it looks fresh. So all those things can be actually uh, found out using hyperspectral imaging. And then finally we are also moving towards a continuum uh, data analysis or video analysis where using the video feeds, we'd be able to not only monitor but then also help into sorting and grading of all these vegetables. Uh, quickly into the team, we've, uh, we've got a team of about uh, five co-founders. We are there in India and US and uh, we've been supported by people across the continuum. We've been uh, working with the advisors who've, who've worked with Cargills and uh, uh, Wipros of the world and then we've also got uh, support of ISAP which is the Indian Society of Agribusiness Professionals. So that's about it. Thank you. Intelica is a vehicle telematics platform currently focusing on the connected car ecosystem for India. Uh, who are we? We are an analytics-based telematics company currently in the space of IoT, big data, and telematics. Uh, yeah. So we are a 50-plus team who have, of automotive engineers, data scientists, who have been able to achieve a lot in telematics today. Uh, we started off at the B2C space where we didn't find too much traction, started off in 2015. We didn't find too much traction there in the B2C space, figured that we required a lot more funding for that as well, and quickly pivoted our model to the B2B space. It's been about a year and a half since we've been in the B2B space, and a few of our achievements that we've been able to achieve so far. We're in 20,000 plus vehicles on the ground today. We have two OEM signups. We're truly in the big data space because we receive our servers receive 72 million beacons a day. Uh, we have 1.5 terabytes of raw data, which is essentially quite big when you look at it as analyzed data today. Our cars on the platform travel 1,500 kilometers every single minute. Uh, we we identify 900 plus vehicle parameters uh, on a day -to daily basis, and we analyze 18,000 drivers a month. We are able to profile drivers today and give an understanding on what kind of drivers there are and even segment them. Um, moving on. Uh, just to give you an idea of the connected car. Uh, yeah. Just to give you on the connect, where, where, where Intelica seeds itself in the ecosystem today, we are looking at addressing all the entire automotive ecosystem today. Uh, looking, let me start off with the, uh, with the, with the services space. We are, looking, we are able to do predictive maintenance today using sensor fusion and using data from the OBD to get useful life estimation on various parts of the vehicle. We are able to relay this information to various service centers uh, who are able to essentially create multiple touch points with their client and be able to give them a better, a better, better customer feedback. Uh, we are in the fleet, fleet, fleet space where we are able to help fleet owners um, optimize their fleet usage, lower downtime on their fleets, as well as able to, able, for, able, able, able to give them better visibility on their fleets to be able to understand what is happening on their fleet level. We are looking at tying up with insurance companies to launch user-based insurance in India, uh, where you can look at pay as you drive or pay how you pay how you drive. This essentially gives you gives the customer a benefit of lowering the premiums in case they drive really well or in case the car is not being used too much. Uh, we are looking at tying up with auto finance companies who want visibility on financing of their vehicles. Since there's a high risk portfolio for them and they don't know whether the loans are going to get paid, we are able to give them utilization data on understanding if a person is 
a willful defaulter if a person's utilization is good and they're able to upsell to their clients as well. Uh, we are in touch with OEMs where we give data back to OEMs for them to understand how their cars perform better on the road today. How can they design better cars with better fuel economy and lower emissions on the road today? We have tied up with emergency services in case a vehicle meets an accident. We're able to inform emergency services, tell emergency services where to place ambulances, which are the most accident prone areas in the country as well today. Uh, I'll move on to a success story, uh, what we've been able to achieve uh, for a shared mobility partner. Uh, we work with Zoomcar very tightly, and the entire back end of Zoomcar's data is essentially handled by us. So I'll just run you through the entire perspective of what we do for Zoomcar in a shared mobility space and self-drive space. Uh, when, when, some, when a customer goes in front of the app and they're able to uh, walk in front of the car, let's assume they cannot find the car, it's parked in a big parking lot, they can go onto the app, hit find my car, and the car is going to honk twice and flash its light twice for you to be able to find it. Once you walk up to the car, you're going to be able to unlock and lock the car using your phone. Uh, your, your app will have a password that is time protected and you will be able to use that uh, phone to unlock and lock the car as long as you have access for a particular time. As soon as the customer sits into the car, we begin to monitor how he drives. And this takes it from multiple levels, from a driver behavior perspective, from a vehicle maintenance perspective, as well as what kind of maintenance cost is, it, is that particular driver causing to that vehicle, right? We're able to monitor if the person is wearing a seat belt and driving, for example, if he's using his indicators while driving, uh, is he using his uh, high beam while driving as well, trying to make the roads a safer place and trying to inform the customer in case, you know, he might have forgotten or in case he's unaware, the fact that, you know, he's turned without using an indicator, which could be dangerous, right? From, from, from the customer perspective, who's our customer, Zoomcar, we give them data on how the customer's driving. They're able to profile their customers and understand who are their good customers, who are their bad customers today, who is the customer causing the most amount of wear and tear to their cars. So a lot of novice drivers come to Zoomcar, they forget to put the handbrake down while driving and this causes huge engine damage. We're able to warn this, send a customer an SMS saying this is what is happening. In case the customer does not adhere to what we are seeing, we can immobilize that particular vehicle as well. Uh, we're able to give you a useful life estimation on various parts as clutches, brakes, suspension, and give you an overall understanding on how much useful life is left. Is the car healthy enough to go for the next trip or not? Right? When the vehicle comes back, the uh, Zoom car has an easy way to understand when the vehicle's reached its location, how much of kilometers he's driven, how much of fuel he's used, and what is happening on that front, and how, how much does the customer need to pay at the end of it. This is an overall thing that we've been able to build for Zoomcar, and we are currently live with all of Zoomcar today. We're supporting them on their Zap perspective as well, where somebody can own a car and share their car when they aren't using it, which helps the customer generate revenue back to them. And all this is done seamlessly without any human inter intervention. The customer can just walk up to the car, unlock it, take it, drive it, drop it back, and we're able to monitor everything on that front. Um, where does machine learning and AI come into this? So I'll just give you a couple of examples. We are able to get useful life estimation on a car part, for example, clutch, right? A uh, lot of cars, a lot, lot of fleet companies have issues with clutches because they're an extremely high wear and tear item. Automotive OEMs and, and dealers are never going to give you warranty on clutch items because they can easily be burnt out within the day because of bad driving, right? A clutch today in a car does not have a single sensor. And we don't add a single sensor to the car to be able to understand clutch behavior. What we do essentially is we use sensor fusion and ML. We be able to understand what is happening on the clutch by getting a derived health from multiple parameters from the car that leads us to a derived health of the clutch. Right? When it comes to fuel, I think a lot of people say that you know if I'm able to get fuel from a vehicle and I'm able to get and read what the vehicle's fuel is, it's very simple for me to tell you what the fuel is. It's not as simple as what everyone thinks it is because every car's fuel tank is designed differently, the way the sensor is placed is different, and the sensor resolution is completely different, right? If I need to know to a 99% accuracy how much of fuel somebody is filled in the petrol bunk, matters a lot to a particular customer, right? And the sensor has its limit as well. Post a sensor reaching a full limit, which the car reads, gives me data saying it's full, uh, the tank is full, the customer is still able to fill in about five to six liters of fuel in the car, right? How do you address that issue, right? So we are able to essentially use ML and AI to be able to address this issue, and after the car driving for 20 kilometers after filling fuel, we are able to tell you how much fuel is left in the tank, right? Uh, we are able to v uh, validate bills coming from customer side to us saying that is this fuel fill legitimate, is it not legitimate, what has happened, is it trying to cheat us. We have been able to, we, to give you another example, we, have, we worked with KSTDC on a very small pilot project and one of the major issues was again fuel. We were able to identify that each bus was pilfering close to 1000 liters a month from a petrol bunk. 
and we were able to identify which petrol bunk, who was the driver, and what action to be taken to be able to solve that. So we've been able to do, uh, we've been able to work with companies like Ola, and Ola, when you put in our devices, they got a batch of faulty batteries in their vehicles, right? Uh, what happened there was they went back to the OEM and claimed for warranty. The OE said, uh, since you've put additional devices in the car and this is the reason for the battery drain, we cannot void warranty. Since we're sitting on the OBD port, we have an understanding of what was the battery charge and how the battery was used as soon as our device went on board, how much battery we have consumed and why the batteries have drained. We generated an end-to-end -end report using our platform and data that we received, and Ola was able to go back to the manufacturer and actually claim that warranty back and that cost back for them. Uh, moving on, sorry, yeah, moving on, some of the products that we have, yeah, some of the products, some of the clients that we have, this is a small snapshot of the clients that we currently work with. We work with Volvo on the construction equipment side. We're able to tell Volvo when a warranty wa claim is valid, when a warranty claim is not valid based on the data that we receive. Uh, we're able to work with Ajax Fury and understand what, what kind of cement and what kind of quality of cement is coming out of their vehicles. Uh, we, are, we have warehouse optimization. We are looking at driver fingerprinting. So what we've realized is that every, every person and every driver today has a unique driving style and a fingerprint associated with them. Right? And the particular driver drives the same way every single day, the way he brakes, the way he turns, the way he accelerates, the way he changes gear, for example. And we're able to identify if the driver is drowsy right now and if the driver is uh, drunk and driving just simply by analyzing data and there's no way that he can cheat that because that essentially comes out of the way he drives at that point in time. Uh, we're looking at building an ADAS solution which essentially looks at forward collision warning, rear lane detection, as well as pedestrian detection. The difference here is with the ADAS solution that we're looking at building, we're looking at training it for Indian roads for uh, on Indian roads. So a lot of the solutions out there in the market today are essentially trained on the U US and European market and brought to India, which doesn't really work well. We're looking at using a data set from India, looking at working with multiple companies that put cameras, collect data, and analyze that data, and build the algorithm specifically tuned for Indian roads. Um, we work with VRL Logistics. We work with uh, a lot of bike rental companies where we are able to tell them if somebody is pushing their bike and trying to steal it, somebody is towing the bike away, or if it's an expensive bike and somebody has just dropped it while the stand was parked. So they're able to analyze what kind of data we're able to get on the vehicle health as well, on the high-end bikes. This is a small snapshot of who we are, what we've achieved so far. Uh, I'd like to thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, NASCOM, for giving us this opportunity.